Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Erin Hardick. I'm the senior researcher and content strategist at Z Prime, and I will also be your moderator for today's webinar, Integrating and Automating Clean Energy Assets, presented by FreeWave. So before we get into the content for today, I'm just going to share a few housekeeping notes. If you're having trouble viewing the slides or hearing us, usually refreshing your browser will do the trick. And this new age of video conferencing, I think we're all very aware of the possibility of poor connection or cutting in and out. So if you do miss anything, don't worry. We'll have the full webinar playback available shortly after we wrap up. In the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see the Q&A box. The last 15 minutes of today's webinar will be dedicated to answering audience questions. So you can use that Q&A box to submit your questions anytime during the webinar, but we will answer them at the end and we will get to as many as possible. So now on to today's topic and speakers. Clean energy assets drive the energy transition as they continue to pop up on the grid. Utilities and energy companies are now faced with the challenge of integrating and automating these assets to maintain reliability and affordability for their customers. Industrial IoT devices and wireless networks create the visibility and control needed to integrate, automate, and monitor distributed clean energy assets. Without distributed IIoT networks, these assets can't really achieve their full potential and propel grid transformation. So today, our industry experts will provide an overview of wireless and edge network for clean energy assets, talk about some use cases, and touch on some of the financial benefits of the deploying distributed IIoT networks. So joining me today are Cameron Freeberg. Cameron is the utility strategist for the electric vehicles and emerging technology team at Austin Energy, and Greg Corey. Greg is the director of customer and technical support at Freewave Technologies. Austin Energy is a community-owned utility. They are a not-for-profit enterprise of the city of Austin. In 2019, they served a total of 496,000 customers. They've set a goal to reach 100% carbon-free generation by 2035, and in 2019, their renewable energy load offset reached 39%. Freewave Technologies is a 27-year leader in long-range industrial machine-to-machine -machine wireless solutions. FreeWave has helped thousands of customers achieve reliable connectivity for data telemetry and command and control in some of the most challenging, remote, and rugged environments in the world. Today, they are transforming the extreme edge of operations and the proliferation of smart devices within it into a connected part of the enterprise with an ecosystem of solutions evolved for IIoT. So before I get our speakers involved, I just wanted to share some Z Prime research with you. These first two slides are from our interactive infographic, Network Trends for Utility and City Infrastructure Modernization. So first here, we're looking at the key forces driving digital modernization and critical network infrastructure. I wanna bring your focus to the third key driver, integrating distributed energy resources. Communication networks are integral to the success, uh, the successful integration of DERs into the grid. So during today's webinar, our panelists will talk about how critical networks can support DER integration, control, and optimization. Next, we have the expected benefits of using advanced communication networks to integrate IIoT devices. The top benefit most utilities expect to achieve through uh, using advanced, advanced communication networks is a faster, more responsive grid. Advanced communication networks enable remote monitoring and control of grid assets and even 
intelligence and automation at the grid edge, making response times much faster. But if you actually look down to the fifth line, you'll see increased integration of distributed generation and storage. So today our panelists will discuss how this is a result of advanced communication networks. And then this last slide is from a report we completed back in 2018 titled The Autonomous Grid in the Age of Artificial Intelligence of Things. It's important to keep in mind this graph is now two years old as we interpret it. So I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the graph, specifically distributed energy resources, resources and energy storage. It shows that these two areas are the ones utilities were most interested in supporting with, a with AI in the next three years. So taking into account the two years that have passed since the publication and DERs and energy storage now become the highest priority for automation within the next 12 months for utilities. So our panelists will also touch on the opportunities to to support these resources with automation and how advanced communication networks are necessary to achieve this. So that wraps up our intro. I want to get our panelists involved now. And Cameron, I'll start with you. We're gonna, we're gonna start by talking about kind of the current state of utilities and using advanced communication networks. What do you see as the current state of utilities dealing with clean energy assets, communication networks? What are some of the trends that you're kind of identifying in the market? Well, uh, utilities are about as far along as they've ever been with these distributed clean energy assets. Um, and it really differs by what that actual asset is and how far along we are with it. I mean, if you just look at you know, traditional utility infrastructure, it's been very centralized, you know, everything from generation all the way down to basically the meter. Um, there's certain things that have been around a lot longer than others. Um, when we look at things like thermostats, uh, that's something that utilities have been in that space for quite a while. But now, and, and solar as well, I put that on the list too. But now you're starting to see kind of things that have a lot more opportunity, but also require a lot more control. Um, things like energy storage, battery systems that are becoming more mainstream, either in customers' homes, at commercial buildings, um, and then even uh, more so electric vehicles. Um, like that's that's kind of a new area that's a it's a growing market with a potentially huge cap on it. So uh, the state at which we're at with certain things like thermostats and having you know customers enrolled knows and being able to do those controls is relatively probably mature. But that's not where it's going to end. It's going to continue to grow with all these other technologies. And utilities are really grasping with, well, how do we not necessarily control them, but how do we, you know, use those as assets or how do we look at those as assets or, or engage with our customers through those devices? And it's kind of a a step-by-step -step approach with each kind of device, each vendor under that device. Um, so it's it's way more kind of hands-on controlled as, you know, what utilities you know, historically have done. Yeah, and after we hear from Greg, Cameron, we'll get into how that kind of creates challenges for you guys at Austin Energy. So Greg, same question for you. What are you seeing as the current state of utilities dealing with clean energy assets? What are some of the trends that you're seeing? And Greg, you're on mute. Let me unmute myself. Is that better there? <laughs> yes. Okay. Let me uh, let me start over again here. Here at FreeWave, um, we've been able to ride the wave of renewables that we've seen over the past couple of years. So there's been strong programs in place at the federal, state, and also corporate level. Um, that are incentivizing the creation of renewable energy projects. And when we have more distributed power generation, we have a need for 
uh, communication infrastructure that differs from what you would normally see with centralized power generation. Um, FreeWave has a lot of experience in monitoring and controlling remote assets for the fossil fuels industry. Um, working in the oil and gas world, uh, we don't really have a, a choice where a wellhead might be that we need to monitor for production. So it's interesting coming from the fossil fuel side, how we're seeing this kind of decentralization of renewables where we're applying a lot of the technologies that we've traditionally used in oil and gas to now monitor these uh, renewable power generation assets that are spread over you know larger geographic areas. And so Cameron, back to you about how the current state of the market has created, the changes going on has created challenges. What are some of the current challenges Austin Energy faces in the growing number of clean energy assets coming onto the grid? Um, I'll kind of start with a little bit of a what's the opportunity for us before the challenge. Um, make it a little bit sunny first before I bring some cloudiness into it. Um, so uh, one of the opportunities for that is since we're now getting out of that kind of like centralized area, um, we're starting to be able to have more interactions and have more specific programs with our direct customers. I mean, if you just look historically what interactions between a customer and a utility probably look like, it's probably either setting up an account, uh, reporting an outage, or paying a bill. So not necessarily the most positive interactions sometimes. Um, so now having programs that are kind of tailored towards things that customers are actually interested in now, whether it be you know, renewables or sustainability or energy efficiency and saving money on bills, that's kind of one of the huge opportunities for it. Um, the challenge within that comes from, um, I'd say, first of all, is interoperability. Um, so if we're doing, if we're trying to either do utility programs that, let's just use thermostats, for example, um, where it's, it's really about, you know, reducing load and using thermostats or some other device for reducing that load, well, you have to have some sort of communication point to that device. And um, it's fine if you do that with maybe uh, one or two, but within this market, there are a lot more vendors coming online that are creating these things in the thermostat world, the electric vehicle world, electric vehicle charging, energy storage, uh, water heaters, everything, smart inverters. Um, and so how do you not have it where uh, you're having to control this series of devices through you know, 50 different kind of portals through, you know, closed stand or through closed standards that might be uh, that get you in like things like vendor lock in things like that. So, so how do you have kind of a centralized platform for controlling all these devices? And how do you have a centralized platform for, you know, you know, sending messaging to customers, reporting, all of that kind of stuff. So interoperability is is definitely, you know, one of those areas that's kind of challenging. Uh, the other is just from, you know, again, traditional utility operations is we owned everything for a while or, you know, bought into it. Uh, now with these assets, a lot of them are customer owned and customer cited. So how do you make that connection point with customers, uh, become a trusted resource to, you know, work with them on it? Um, so it's just completely different operationally from an ownership method, from uh, kind of centralized to decentralized, and then working with, um, the vendor and the OEM community and, and how, you know, to maintain open standards and, and have any way you can do things in aggregate now as opposed to, you know, having to go across a thousand different platforms. So not, it's not just like little changes, it's significant changes to the business model and how utilities kind of run the grid. Yeah, I mean, uh, and that's uh, and now we're looking at things that we can be more reactive to. So it's not just now necessarily. I mean, you know, yes, matching generation with load, but now uh, having this kind of second tier of management from the device level. Um, and then when you get into things like energy storage, which I think we're going to go into in a, a little bit, what that opportunity presents, and then huge loads like electric vehicles especially medium and heavy duty electric vehicles and what that looks like. Uh, so there's just a lot more opportunity out there. It's just finding those levers to get to those devices, to get to those customers, to be able to take advantage of that or, you know, uh, increase value on the grid for customers. 
Thanks, Cameron. Greg, you mentioned the transition from centralized to decentralized. One thing that you talked about when we were preparing for this webinar was how decentralized generation is now covering a larger geographic area. Can you talk about how that creates further challenges and having these resources cover a lot more space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so these renewable projects pose a series of challenges um, at every point in the implementation. Uh, you don't get to, to choose based upon the location where, you know, a, a solar panel um, or a wind turbine should go based on convenience, right? It's based upon the environmental positioning. So that presents a, uh, a number of challenges. I mean, even just constructing the site, right? Using local labor, maybe it's a remote location. Um, and those challenges carry on through when we talk about communications infrastructure for some of these locations. Um, some of them may have uh, transmission lines. Obviously, we have to find a way to transfer the power, but there may not be fiber communication lines to the location. It could be uh, underserved by the cellular uh, market for coverage there. So solving that communications infrastructure has been a uh, driver of free wave solutions for the um, renewables market there. And those challenges, you know, vary depending upon the location, but it's all about how we can get data to and from those locations. And when we talk about the actual data um, from these assets, it's um, controlling load balancing. So turning things on and off, it's monitoring processes remotely to make sure they're efficient. And also speaking to the security side that you brought up in the diagram earlier, um, site security is an issue. So we don't have a centralized location where, you know, there's somebody uh, on site at all times with these remote locations. How can we get video off of that site in order to protect that asset? Um, because there might not be, you know, personnel on site 24 seven. So all of these challenges um, directly affect the communication networks that we implement and develop for these types of uh, distributed architectures. When you talk about the various types of locations, are you referring to like very remote areas? So say like a rural cooperative serving a, a very dispersed rural area versus like a, a utility that serves a city where there's a lot of infrastructure. Is that what you mean by different types of locations? Yeah, the differences in geography. Um, there are some sites in rural Arizona um, for solar that are essentially uh, in the middle of nowhere. And then there might be assets closer to town, like here in Boulder, Colorado, there's a, a wind turbine farm, you know, that's pretty close to uh, city limits there. So those types of challenges in that um, it could be close to an urban area where there might be infrastructure uh, that you can leverage, or, I mean, it could be in the middle of nowhere. Thanks, Greg. Cameron, I want to talk about um, the Austin Shines project. Uh, it's really allowed you guys to explore how to take advantage of clean energy assets. Can you tell us about Austin Shines? Uh, sure, um, I'll try and uh, talk about a three and a half year project in under five minutes. Uh, so, so let's let, let me dive into that quickly. Um, yeah, so Austin Shines, just for a little bit of background, was a, a grant we received from the U.S. Department of Energy, where the whole reasoning behind it was how you incorporate more solar onto the grid. In the you know one of the methods they were looking at, and the one we chose was basically in 2016 was integration of energy storage with solar. Um, so what we did is we did, we didn't want to just do like one use case application. We wanted to look at it systematically. And so like, okay, we're, we're going to integrate all of this within our traditional grid infrastructure. And so we deployed energy storage at the residential level. We deployed it at the commercial level. And then we did two utility scale batteries. So um, with solar smart inverters, uh, and um, and actually connected in to our systems, and um, I will <laughs> uh, from the grid scale application. I just want to kind of throw it out as the when we're looking at large scale batteries that are out there in the public, 
um, we did two use cases, one within our substation, and then one was actually in a neighborhood. Um, I can't stress the amount of uh, vetting that has to go into placing a battery in the middle of a neighborhood. So just a fun caveat for anybody looking to place a battery in a neighborhood, there are a lot of layers involved to that. Um, so Austin Shines were really meant to look at um, how, you know, we can both take advantage of, of these kind of assets that are out there, um, particularly energy storage. And um, the first thing with basically taking advantage of all these distributed assets is how do you derive value from it? Traditionally, load reduction. I think that's been the kind of the main thing. And again, I'll point to thermostats as kind of the use case for that and how we reduce our transmission costs uh, through doing aggregate load reduction with thermostats. Energy storage, a uh, lot more flexibility than that um, because, um, you know, now we're looking at things like two-way flow. And so through Austin Shines and through having solar pair with storage and these all the different applications is we looked at actually 19 different use cases uh, for deriving value. I have no idea if I could even go through all 19, um, but we didn't test all 19. So through the development of those, you know, how we get value, uh, we went forward with six of them, um, with, with six different use cases for uh, for driving value from energy storage paired with solar. Um, and, you know, we did it in a, a, with a few different kind of frames around it, one being around customer value. Um, and um, what that was really focused on was in the commercial space, we knew a big barrier uh, for customer bills in the commercial side is demand charge. So how do we utilize these battery systems for reducing demand charges within a commercial customers um, on their bill? Um, how do we kind of maximize both the uh, the amount of power coming out of these batteries as well as the duration to make sure that, you know, that demand charge is reduced actually in a month because you can discharge a battery at full capacity, uh, reduce the demand on a building for about two hours, but that's not going to cut down a demand charge because then at two hours and one minute, okay, well, all that power comes back on. So it's really, you know, there's a lot of uh, thought that has to go into um, to making sure that that kind of duration is there for it. Um, we also wanted to look at things like grid reliability with the utility scale units. Um, and then finally, the third area we looked at for driving value was on the economic side. So how do you use energy storage to you know, do either energy arbitrage with real-time pricing? Um, you know, in August in Texas, uh, the per megawatt price is not cheap, um, especially when it's 105 outside and you have peaker plants running up. So how do you tie uh, potentially market data into these things too to take advantage of that? And um, so... Um, I could go on for about another hour on shines, but I, I kind of hope that might be a good first pass at it. No, that was great. And narrowing it down to kind of the three value streams, I, I think helps. So, Greg, over to you. What role do you see? I want to also talk about grid edge computing, which I mentioned mm -hmm. in the introduction. What role do you see grid edge computing and intelligence playing in the control and monitoring of clean energy assets. And then can you also maybe talk about, it could be a separate thought, but SCADA and how it kind of fits into this ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, coming from a background in wireless hardware, I think what we've seen in the consumer space is what we're gonna see in the industrial space. And we used the uh, the buzzwords earlier, IoT or the Internet of Things, and then IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things. And what we've seen in the consumer space in the mobile phone market for years now that it's becoming less about the communications hardware and more about the software um, that's running on that hardware. So FreeWave's approach to these wireless uh, industrial networks for monitoring renewable assets has been to shift some of that software focus from being in the centralized location and that type of architecture to being more distributed. When you have a distributed architecture with uh, what we call edge computing or the ability to make decisions at the edge, um, we actually reduce latency. So going back to one of the charts that you had shown there, is that you know faster speeds, faster networks, being able to make changes and decisions quicker. 
And with edge computing, you can really leverage uh, data in order to make those decisions quickly. So instead of sending data back to a centralized location, which we would traditionally see in power assets, we can take a specific data point, take it into one piece of hardware, analyze it, make a decision right at the edge of that network without having to send it back to a centralized location. In certain processes, um, milliseconds may count, seconds may count, and we can reduce the time for communication with edge computing, um, generally speaking there. So uh, FreeWave has been pursuing the uh, smart radio, per se, of the industrial radio world, in that kind of like everybody uses software on their phones, um, industrial radios can run software in order to make these processes uh, overall more efficient. And when it comes to when it comes to securing, making sure that all of this is done in a secure manner, is the focus on securing the device or securing the network, or is it both? Easy answer. Um, all the above. When you talk <laughs> about a model for security, the first layer of that is actual physical security to the device, which can be an issue when you have distributed assets, um, as I mentioned previously. So yeah, ensuring that there's map filtering in place, that ports are locked, so somebody just can't open up a cabinet and directly plug into something. Um, you'd be surprised in various energy-related industries uh, how easy it is to physically access something. So when we talk about security, that has to be, you know, obviously the base layer for everything, the physical security, and then all the way through the whole network stack. So the encryption of data moving across those networks, the authentication uh, to be able to access that data, um, completely firewalling off these networks um, so they're not exposed to the internet. That's also a hard edge that some customers take with that. Um, some of our customers that we deal with have completely uh, private networks that are not connected in any way, shape, or form to the internet. Um, that has its own pros and cons, that approach. Uh, other times, people want to publish uh, directly to the cloud. And those types of applications require specific, you know, security procedures and uh, different types of encryption to ensure those things are safe moving across the network. And one more question on security. I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole, but how, I mean, in your experience working with utilities, how advanced or like, do you think they have a good understanding of what it takes to actually fully secure these networks and systems? Or do you think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in that area? That's a really loaded question. Um, so my overall answer is it could always be improved. So there are a number of regulations out there that govern cybersecurity um, when it comes to power generation, but not all of those are actually implemented in the correct way. Um, people will cut corners. Security is always a trade-off with usability. Um, so sometimes making something secure makes it much more difficult to use. And that's where we see people start to become more lax on security is because of the usability implications of it. They want something that's uh, easy to access that you know any one of their technicians can work with. Um, so there's, there's definitely room for improvement. We have seen um, a slow but sure progression to be people being more security oriented. Um, but yeah, every once in a while, I still see stuff out there that uh, I'll scratch my head about that <laughs> is just uh, way out in the weeds. But overall, I think the progression is moving in the right direction. Very good. So, Greg, one more question for you. Let's get back to talking about some use cases. Do you have any specific projects that highlight the importance of wireless connectivity and remote control and monitoring of decentralized assets? Yeah, and I can cover both angles on that. So on the monitoring side, FreeWave has worked on a number of projects with wind turbines. 
So we have uh, an industrial radium that's actually in the top um, of the nacelle on the wind turbine there. And there'll be a collection of sensors um, distributed throughout the mechanisms in the wind turbine that are measuring vibration. And the free wave radio will be collecting that data and then transmitting that over a long range uh, back to a centralized location for analysis. And that data is being used for predictive maintenance. So if there is a specific vibration that's being seen in part of the wind turbine, um, that could indicate that a mechanical failure is imminent and to take corrective action. And there are a number of different actions you can take based upon that data. Um, if it's low in the wind season, you, you might be able to ride it out. Um, you know, and until you can get something on site uh, to address that. Um, if it's something that's super critical uh, to the function of the mechanical drive system there, maybe you turn that asset off uh, before creating a problem. With wind turbines, the maintenance can be in incredibly um, expensive to do work. Uh, sometimes you have to actually drop the blades from the turbine to the ground in order to do work. So we've seen bills for just getting cranes on site um, in the six figure range, just to be able to address some of these issues. So through the use of data, if we can crunch those numbers and prevent these maintenance issues from becoming significant headaches, there's a huge return on investment there. So that continuous monitoring is very important and that has a real world value proposition to it. Um, on the control side, we've worked in applications for load balancing. Uh, I worked on a project for demand response load balancing um, in a very hot region of the U.S. with air conditioning units. Uh, so there wasn't existing, um, we'll say, operator infrastructure to support that data. So we designed a solution that monitored the temperature of these air conditioning units and uh, we were able to balance you know with the temperature inside versus turning these air conditioners on and off um, for load balancing there um, in hot regions of the us if you lose power for a significant amount of time uh, that actually becomes a health and safety issue um, especially in assisted living facilities or other you know at risk communities where you know if it's above 100 degrees that could pose a threat to uh, residents there so we worked on a project where we were reading the temperature and then doing corrective load balancing but only for very short intervals in order to keep those homes cool despite the load balancing and cameron that's something that you guys at austin energy must face you know you serve texas one of the hottest regions of the United States. You mentioned, you know, in the summer, you know, everybody needs their air conditioning. How does Austin Energy think about this problem? Uh, well, first of all, um, when Greg was talking about cybersecurity and uh, utilities room for improvements and lax, he was uh, not talking about Austin Energy. Um, we are <laughs> fantastic over here. So um, disclaimer. Uh, no, for, for things like demand response in controlling thermostats, I mean, that's that's the, the good news is, you know, when we have demand response programs, and especially all tied around, um, you know, air conditioning and thermostats, you know, when that load's going to be there. It's, I mean, it's not, it's not a, a deep science to know that from June to September, it's going to be very hot here, uh, especially in the middle of the afternoon, and that's when you curtail thermostats. Um, the downside is, you know, it's also 105, so you want to have parameters in place. So you don't want to just look at that just as an opportunity for the utility and say, oh, wow, we can cut all those off for the entire afternoon and reduce our load. That would not go well ever. So, you know, doing things like 15 minute intervals of curtailing these uh, thermostats or or even maybe staggering devices so you're not doing everything at once for long durations. And then most importantly is giving customers the, the ability to opt out. Um, so if they're enrolled in these programs, I mean, nine times out of 10, they might either be more than okay with it or like me, like I don't even notice when they curtail mine. 
Um, like, I, like it's, I've been enrolled in the uh, our demand response programs with thermosets for years now, and it just, I don't even notice it. But there might be some times, like, you know, whether uh, you might have, uh, you know, like an elderly uh, relative staying with you or, or something like that, where, where heat is actually an issue. And so the ability to opt out is, you know, um, balancing that utility value with customer value, because they're the same thing. I mean, I, and so if you don't have those kind of abilities for folks to either opt out or ways to thoughtfully stagger those kinds of events, then they're not, you know, they're not all inclusive. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. So Greg, we'll go back to you. You've mentioned kind of throughout this conversation that the different types of communication technologies. Can you talk more in depth about those, the different types and how utilities can leverage them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll stick with the wireless topic because that's my area of expertise. So in the absence of hardwire infrastructure, there's several different wireless technologies uh, that providers can use. So obviously there's the big one, uh, cellular, which a lot of us take for granted nowadays, uh, given the proliferation of towers uh, in areas that we inhabit. Um, but it, you know, it should also be noted that I do deal with assets where there is not cell coverage and uh, there's not great incentive for a cellular provider to put coverage out there because there's just not enough customers. Um, so there's cellular, there's microwave, uh, there's long range unlicensed radios like free wave manufacturers. And then there's also licensed radios that generally allow for greater range, but uh, much slower data rates. There's no one size fits all uh, solution when it comes to wireless. There's a, a right tool for a right type of job. And the trade off with these different types of technologies is usually ongoing cost. So do you own the network? Uh, yes or no. There are some companies that are okay carrying a, a monthly data cost for cellular services. And then there's other companies that prefer to invest in the capital equipment and then own the network there. So um, that's a big difference. Uh, you know, is it service provided or is it something that you actually own? Um, when you go to microwave, uh, that obviously allows for very high data rates, but it requires a very clear line of sight. Um, when we talk about something that's high frequency, we think about two laser beams kind of pointed at each other, and uh, you have to have absolutely no obstructions in order to have that link function. When we get down to the more remote assets that FreeWave specializes in, maybe it's not a perfect line of sight um, this specific communication link maybe there's some rolling terrain or some trees or things like that and that's where lower frequencies um, come into play because they travel better through signal path obstructions and the general trade-off um, is you can go fast or you can go far so when we talk about longer range communication links that are partially obstructed um, we're not going to get the same data rates that we would if we were serving our home Wi-Fi, but for a lot of these applications, the data is actually pretty small. Um, we're looking at the temperature of something. We're looking at, at voltage. You know, we're turning something on and off. Um, so on the plus side, you can get away with low bandwidth networks on a lot of these applications um, just due to the size of the data. When we go to the lowest frequency, I mentioned like in the license band, like uh, in the 450 range, for example, which has been used by different water wastewater utilities and power generation companies for years, um, we're talking 9,600 baud, uh, worse than AOL dial-up type speeds. But the range that you can achieve, you know, that's where the trade-off comes in. If you can cover a 40, 50 mile link, out in the middle of nowhere to control something for a remote community, um, there's real benefit in that. Um, one of the difficult balancing acts that we see currently is the need for operational data, as I mentioned, and the need for site security. 
So when we start including video um, and a lot of these topologies, that's where things get complex because as I noted, the general trade-off is you can go fast or you can go far with wireless. Um, it's really difficult to do both. And touching back on the security aspect there, the physical layer is the base layer for all security. And uh, a lot of these remote sites need to be monitored in case there is an incident. Great, thank you, Greg. And Cameron, I wanna close out our conversation talking about automation. You've mentioned you think that there are you know, a lot of opportunities for utilities to leverage automation and kind of connecting all of this data that is coming in from these decentralized assets. Tell, tell me about that and what you think the opportunities are yeah um well first i'm kind of confused that the the there's um about the aol dial-up modem not being a, a quality product i mean my 56k modem over there is, is still <laughs> still pumping out the data um yeah no there's like as far as like the the data coming in um like aaron you pointed out earlier as far as like the assurances that we have with air conditioning being on in in texas and how you run programs for that right um, and now we talk about the opportunity for these other DERs, whether it be energy storage. Um, I'll mention EVs again because there's a future aspect of vehicle to grid and what that looks like. Also curtailing charging, much like you thermostats. Um, so one of the areas where you need that initial data in, in kind of creating that value is, are those same resources going to be available to the same certainty that thermostats are in the middle of summer in Texas? Um, that's not something we know yet. So it's it's kind of that first layer is you want to make the business case for going forward with these a lot of these things, but first you need the data to kind of kind of justify those. Um, so it's it's not just it's it's that layer of data for getting it. And and Greg and I come. I mean, his level of expertise is in kind of the edge computing side. I'm in the DER program kind of development side. So when we look at it through uh, kind of different lenses in a good way, um, but how do we start? um collecting data from whether it be the you know vehicles or whether it be through um charging patterns at you know the residential level and, and how do you start getting those things to do program development but then once you launch something is now you're connecting to uh multiple vendors some and some of proprietary standards potentially so how do you you know how do you kind of create an open standards approach to doing something like that and how do you get that data in a centralized point because if you just look at like a population of 10,000 electric vehicles and wanting to, you know, either do low control functions or something like that, um, how can you do that with, you know, an aggregate click of a button or uh, do the same functionality across, uh, you know, these 10,000 devices? And so there needs to be some sort of aggregation that's somewhat sophisticated involved to do that. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, the access to that data is important all the way from program development through to actually run a, um, you know, uh, an inclusive and uh, successful DER program. Thanks, Cameron. So we're about to get into our q and I see that some people have already submitted questions. We'll get to those in a second. But if you have a question for our panelists, go ahead and use that Q&A box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen to submit it. So, Greg, I will have you start with any closing thoughts you may have before we get into those audience questions. Yeah, um, I guess in closing, I'm not going to use the word synergy. Um, I'm not going to do that, but how we put all of these different things together and that kind of leads into one of the questions I see here um, in the chat room. So, uh, you know, the, the next challenge is how do we take all this data, protect it and put it in a location where it can be accessed seamlessly by people who need to view um, that data and how do we ensure that all these different types of wireless systems can interoperate as well as the protocols they're using um, so i guess in essence the, the 
closing in this and the next open-ended question is how do we break down all these different silos that we're talking about to have one seamless system from end to end that's that's the next challenge thanks greg and cameron any closing thoughts before we get into q a no it's it, it's the same thing that greg just mentioned it's a it's you know we're kind of looking at that in pieces that that one seamless system and that's everything from interaction with customers to one thing we didn't really touch a whole lot on here is connecting to back end utility stuff <laughs> so that's one of the harder pieces to garner is like um like billing systems or metering infrastructure and how that whole der environment text that back end stuff i mean you know that's one of the major challenges as well so how do you have everything going from you know interaction with the customer all the way back to automation with those types of uh, with those types of software. So um, it's I don't think it's ever going to be perfect, but you'll just continually get better building out that architecture and uh, and utilities now expanding what their architecture is out into the DER world to the customer world. Great. Okay. Now let's get to these questions. I see the one I think both of you were referring to. Um, I'm going to wait to touch on that because let's get to some other topics before we get back to that topic. So we had one question come in making me laugh. We are energy nerds, but not all of our customers are. How do you balance the need to garner participation with the need to keep it simple for the customer who simply wants to continue business as usual and not have to engage with the utility? Cameron, I think maybe you should start with that. Uh, yes, I see that question is from a, a Mary Palmer. Um, uh, sounds like a very bright and young go-getter um, that might work for a, a very well-renowned renewable energy program at a central texas utility i'm just guessing here um but you know, a lot of that is is uh so there's certain things that we want i mean we want to kind of balance that we want to balance customer participation and utility value and uh there's there's there are ways to get customers you know involved in your programs and then not do it to the point of annoyance like we're asking them like to do reporting and stuff like that or installing devices necessarily directly in their homes or whatever um so at least from the ev space a lot of stuff we do is or even a lot of our programs is um if you can get customers to enroll in things and then stuff happens kind of autonomously on the other side much like much like i mentioned in my thermostat situation and and curtailment and me not noticing it but still having the availability to opt out uh, I think that that's a great example of how you, uh, if a customer wants to have that participation, get that incentive, and then be hands off afterwards, they have the ability to do that. Um, and and but if they want to be more active within it, whether it be um, you know opting out of things, um, they can engage with the utility to do that kind of stuff. But it's really just there has to be some sort of baseline option where a customer is enrolled in some sort of program. And it can be a completely passive approach. Um, uh, and it's really about customer choice there. So you can have completely passive to what was referred to as the energy nerds, where I get my usage emails and I actually check those and look how I'm stacking up against last month in uh, projections. So I'm that high engaged customer, but there are a lot of them that aren't. So uh, just having options where you can be a passive customer, but still enrolled in programs. Yeah, and that actually gets back to one of the charts that I showed for key drivers for advanced communication networks was increased customer, um, trying to increase customer satisfaction, the changing needs of customers and how everybody kind of wants a tailored experience. So, um, Greg, I'll point this question to you, and it's the one we were talking about earlier, and Cameron, you can offer any insights that you have. In the pursuit of large scale grid independence, increased connectivity and in IoT technologies, how do you see multiple utility companies adapting our technologies to be able to work together efficiently to adapt and analyze data to better serve their customers? Yes, yeah, so that's um, it's a really open ended question. There's a few different directions um, that you could go. Um, the first topic I want to bring up in response to that are standards um, for wireless communication. So, you know, over the past 10 years, we've made great strides with Wi-Fi. 
I mean, essentially, Wi-Fi is in every device imaginable um, in your house now. There's a Wi-Fi radio. The proliferation of that standard has been far-reaching. We haven't seen the adoption of a wireless standard for long-range unlicensed networks. So FreeWave and a number of other companies in our space are niche players in that some of our technology is still proprietary in that only a, a device from the same manufacturer um, will communicate over the airwaves. So there's still a bit of a silo there to be broken down in that we need a wireless standard for these niche long range low data rate applications. And we just haven't hit that marker yet because the number of devices, um, the opportunity isn't as big as you would see in the consumer space. Um, I still think it's a significant opportunity, but we just haven't seen that collaboration yet that we need in order to drive a standard. So when it comes to wireless communication, the um, sharing of that information and systems working together, uh, a standard would definitely help that. There are a couple small niche standards out there, but nothing that's been widely adopted um, across the board. The other point I want to touch on is you mentioned here, once implementing this new infrastructure, how can this data be shared and protected simultaneously? Um, so there are a number of cloud computing companies that are up and coming that are working on how to take all this data, how to put it into a centralized location um, at very low latency in order to have that single source of truth, even though there's multiple different systems involved. Um, so the recent IPO of Snowflake, um, that's a company that is taking all those different silos of data in the cloud and putting them into one protected interface, uh, that single source of truth to be analyzed and have other types of uh, AI run on it and, and things like that. So there's gonna be opportunities for companies like Snowflake that solve that exact problem. Thanks, Greg. And Cameron, unless you are very interested in answering that question, I'm gonna move on because we are running out of time and there's two questions in here on microgrid. So Cameron, before I ask that, do you have any additional thoughts? Uh, ditto. <laughs> okay. So we have the two questions on microgrids. I'm just going to ask one to kind of encompass both of them. With increased local generation and microgrids, especially in cities and heavy populated areas, how is the utility business model going to adopt or change? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of ways. <laughs> um, it's not it's not going to be the traditional matching generation cost versus um, you know volumetric metering cost potentially on their other end. That's not going to be um, and then kind of balancing that with the demand met to the customer. I, I think that's kind of the simplistic way that like the like electrons flowed before, and that was mostly the entire entire business model. So uh, it's going to be things like you know it's it's going to be a lot of customer facing programs. So you're going to be reliant on a lot of customer sided stuff and relationship with those customers, whether it be through, in, through energy storage or connection to devices, reducing demand now with this whole network as opposed to you know natural gas peaker plants potentially. So like it's gonna it's gonna change you know fundamentally a lot of things that utilities are doing. Um, it's and so in and it's, it's beyond looking at the way energy is valued too. So it's not just necessarily volumetric pricing anymore. It's uh, there, there's a lot of way that energy can be valued potentially differently as well. So and it's not just the way that we're going to interact with our customers, but um, the way that we start seeing uh, you know the way energy generation and um, usage is valued. And Greg, do you have any thoughts on that question? You know what? I'm actually going to take my one and only pass on a question because <laughs> admittedly that is uh, not my area of expertise. I already, did, I already did the same thing, so. <laughs> yeah, I, Q &A. I could fake it here, but I, I won't put you guys through that. <laughs> We have another question that came in. Um, have you seen a change in the relationship with customers 
either residential or commercial, due to the pandemic with more people spending time at home. Cameron, maybe you can answer that first. And Greg, I'm interested if you're seeing util if you've had experience with the utilities having these changed interactions with you know, like lower late, like there's more people in the home, more people on the network, less ability to connect. Um, maybe you could offer some sort of perspective there, but Cameron, I'll start with you first. Yeah, I, I mean, I, of course, there's the things of like energy usage patterns and all that that's changed with the commercial sector being not as full and now more people at home. So, of course, energy usage patterns have changed. But one of the biggest areas I, I, I kind of want to talk about is the way utilities are changing some of their operations. And we've spent an hour talking about like interactions with customers and how that's important. So we're in a pandemic. How do we adjust to that? And uh, one of the areas I really want to give uh, a nod to is, so we have a green building program in Austin Energy that you know does the, uh, design um, kind of standards for green building as well as inspections. So things like virtual inspection processes that they're going through right now that achieve the same result but allow us to still kind of make those interactions with our customers is something it, it, it's very impressive and extremely important. So uh, that's one of the worries was, you know, with this, are we going to lose those connections with customers or are we going to adapt and kind of even potentially make them better? <laughs> like um, now it might be more convenient, more flexible. Um, so I, I think, you know, with all the things bad right now in the world, there's a, a few kind of rays of sunshine as far as operational improvements here and there. And I think that's one of them. And Greg, what about you? Have you seen these relationships change or interactions change in any way? Yeah, you know, speaking about operational improvements, um, it's funny, like the technology, you know, that we're using to host this webinar, like this is not something that came out yesterday. Like this technology has been around for a long time. But I feel like the pandemic has really pushed us to leverage these communication tools that we've had available, but we've just been lazy about because I'll jump on a plane to go visit a customer or fix something because um, it was just easier sometimes to do it that way. But now we're really forced to use these collaborative tools um, online like we've been using and how that's changed FreeWave's business is I talked about having the right tool for the right type of job and wireless connectivity. Um, it's kind of heightened the importance of last mile of connectivity that free wave networks offer. So, you know, we're doing like uh, yesterday, I was doing a Microsoft team meeting with somebody in Houston uh, for somebody that was on a hotspot in North Dakota that was remoted into something 10 miles like out into the middle of nowhere. And we were all doing that through different communication links in this overall system. So FreeWave has always had that last mile of connectivity covered, but now with the pandemic, I feel like we're really uh, efficiently collaborating kind of in the virtual world and looking at these remote assets in order to solve problems. Yeah, absolutely. So that actually brings us to the top of the hour. We are out of time. Thank you everyone who submitted questions for the Q&A. And thank you, Greg, for sharing your insights with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Cameron. We appreciate you. Anytime. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you everyone who attended. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if you missed anything, don't worry. We will have the full replay available to you and we'll email it out as soon as it's ready. We will see you all next time. Have a great day.